So I'd like you to take a moment and think about everything you've learned through the internet. All of the knowledge you've gained, the connections you've built, the ideas that you've shared. There we go. I distinctly remember when I was a teenager back in the 90s, the first time I got on chat, a chat system and talked to somebody in Japan. Uh, another student in Japan, and we had this conversation. I was learning about another culture. Instantly, I felt connected to a broader world beyond the world that in my immediate surroundings. And these last few years in particular, we've been seeing this online learning revolution. It's been all in the media. There's a lot of popularity. The number of websites with online learning resources has been exploding. So what is all this excitement about? What is it that's new about what's going on right now? So there are a couple ideas that have been extolled as so the virtues of these sorts of systems. One of them is this idea that we can now flip the classroom, that we can have students on their own time watch videos um, that, to fill the role of, of, watch, of watching a lecture, and then spend the classroom time doing something more productive, uh, like having the teachers engage with the students, mentor and coach the students, work together on problems. Um, and with teachers being empowered by this to be able to spend more time with the students and to track the progress of the students and to, um, to really be more engaged with the students. Um, Mastery-based learning is another thing this allows. So students can work at their own pace. Students can, we, we don't have to leave any students behind um, who are not able to keep up or moving in a different direction. We can also allow students who are excited about learning something to run with it and not hold them back to keep them in line with everybody else. But there's, there's something else that's sort of the elephant in the room, which is a big idea that's sometimes mentioned, but I think is at the core of what's so important about this online learning revolution. And that's, it's in the missions of a lot of these online platforms. It's this idea of ubiquitous access, that finally we can reach everybody with these educational materials. So Khan Academy's mission statement, changing education for the better by providing a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Uh, Coursera, connecting people to a great education so that anyone around the world can learn without limits. And edX, the future of online education for anyone, anywhere, anytime. So this, the internet has finally allowed us to achieve this goal for the first time ever of reaching everybody with these online educational resources. And the internet now is truly ubiquitous, isn't it? I mean, I can use the internet on, on airplanes. I can use it on, on boats while I'm, while I'm being driven around, not while I'm driving. Um, so if sort of the world is at my fingertips. I feel like I'm connected to the entire world. But there's this sort of nagging doubt, right? Is, or maybe there's some people beyond the fringes. What about people who are sort of outside of the reaches of this network? Presumably, we haven't quite reached everybody yet. Well, it turns out that yes, we're in the middle of an online learning revolution, but not everybody's being included. Two thirds of the world has no internet access, are not internet users. That's four and a half billion people. So this network that we think of as completely ubiquitous is not reaching two thirds of the world. And of the one third that does have access, Many of those are through low bandwidth or expensive bandwidth connections that don't allow them to engage with a lot of these sorts of resources. And it's even worse than that because it's not evenly distributed. The large majority of this connectivity is in affluent countries. Uh, in the poorer countries, 6% uh, have internet access. And this is a problem because specifically those countries are the ones that could in many ways benefit most from these resources. They're the countries that have the fewest teachers, the fewest books, the fewest other educational resources. So the people that could perhaps most benefit from this online learning revolution are the ones who are least able to access it. And it's gonna take generations, decades, before, especially for those, those countries, those populations, connectivity actually does become ubiquitous. The day will come, but in the meantime, we're leaving generation after generation behind. And this is really important because it feeds into this spiral, the spiral of poverty, where a lack of education leads to lower standards of living, and then that leads further to less access to these resources, 
And so we're perpetuating this if we can't intervene and try and break that cycle. So that's why we made KA Light. This is an offline version of Khan Academy. So it's an offline website, which I'll look at in a minute. How is that even possible? So it's a platform for serving these over 4,000 videos that Khan Academy has and everything from math through art history. Um, includes dynamic aspects of the website like progress tracking, points, um, coach reports, so it can still empower the teachers that are using it. Um, and it's designed to run on anything. So let's take a step back and think about how this can work. So if we have a regular website, it's running somewhere in the cloud, and students are connecting through to it uh, through the internet. How can we then bring this into the classroom? Well, it's another type of flipping where we can take in a remote school with no internet access, we can put the server directly into the school. So we can have the website, KLite, running on the server in the school and student computers connecting and students engaging through those computers. Even better, we can replace an expensive high power computer with this inexpensive Raspberry Pi device, which is enough to, uh, to power uh, dozens of, of client devices. And this is a $25 device. Um, that run, built by a nonprofit in the UK uh, that's now been shipping uh, over a million units around the world. So using these low-cost technologies, uh, client devices such as the Akash tablet, which prices are coming down for students to $25, $30 in India, low-cost technology is finally going to be a bridge to allow us to bridge this connection gap um, in, the, in the interim. Of course, there's the question, how can we get the content in there in the first place? And uh, it's not really, in this sense, as bad as it, you might initially think, because into, say, the larger cities, there's going to be some higher bandwidth connections. We can transfer the content, transfer the, the, the software in through these higher bandwidth connections, and then slowly trickle update, connect down through more remote areas, and get the content to them there. And then we can finally take advantage of the sneaker net, so just physical transport. People move around. People can carry a USB stick connected into a computer in a remote school and install the software there and copy the videos over there to give them access. So it can run either just on the end user's computer or it can run on a dedicated server in the school. Teachers can also connect into the system, see user data, and empower the teacher to engage with their students and track their progress while at the same time allowing students to work at their own pace in a mastery-driven um, approach. So we're also working on making it peer-to-peer -peer so that you can have any two devices that come in contact uh, with very low friction without requiring any technical knowledge. They can share synchronized information, synchronized content back and forth with one another um, so that we can really leverage the sneaker net to help get content um, distributed as widely as possible. So this all might sound very nice, but does anybody actually care? Does anybody use it? Turns out, well, so we just launched a few months ago. So we're just in the very early stages, um, but people are using it. Uh, so this is just a subset of some of the places that KLite has been installed um, and running and connecting back to a central server. So these are, this is a subset because these are the ones that have internet and low bandwidth connections or people testing it out where there is internet to get it installed. Um, so these are locations, hundreds around the world, where KLite has been installed and tested. I don't have time to talk about all of these, and we're still learning about all the cool stuff that's being done, but I just want to highlight a couple of the ways it's being used. We're partnering with Open Learning Exchange uh, for a deployment in Ghana, where they're deploying to 5,000 students in 20 schools in rural Ghana that have no internet access, um, flipping the classroom there. This was an unexpected um, use. Uh, within the US, there are also a lot of populations that don't have internet access, and especially high, high bandwidth internet connections. But in, in prisons, um, obviously, there's a lot of value in educational content, uh, but it's hard to, to reach them without, uh, without internet access. Um, so Edward has been using KLite uh, in uh, a prison in Washington state, um, and he's talked about how it's changing, changing his life and allowing him to find a new path for himself. Uh, in Bhutan, the first Raspberry Pi, this is that computer Raspberry Pi, was distributed in Bhutan um, is being used for K Lite. So there was an interesting post about how they're, they're in a country where internet access has only very recently even um, been made available at all. Um, K Lite is, is able to bring some of these resources into students there. And this is an interesting story. So the Sparks family is they did a road trip down through from London down through Africa several years ago with their infant son. Now their son is 
think four or five, uh, and they're planning a road trip leaving in June, uh, going all the way from Alaska down to South America. And they're going to be taking K Light, distributing it to communities along the way, as well as using it directly with their son to help keep up his education um, as, he, as they're on the long trip. Uh, and this was another use case that surprised us. So even at the University of Cape Town, which is one of the top ranked universities in Africa, um, they've made a local installation of K Light for their students to use. And that's because students there have a three gigabyte cap on their bandwidth. Um, but if they access within the local network, they don't have to, it doesn't contribute to that cap. So even at one of the most prestigious universities, one of the top 100 universities in the world, they've installed this to help take advantage of, uh, the well, to help get around the fact that they don't have internet, good internet connectivity. So I'm the person up here telling you about this, but I'm very, very grateful to be part of a large team, the Foundation for Learning Equality, that's making this happen. So Foundation for Learning Equality's mission is to connect the disconnected and to help make universal education truly universal. And I really want to thank all of that team. It's a very, it includes students here at UCSD, um, as well as open source developers on the project around the world, and more and more people are getting involved. Uh, I really want to thank the team and thank you, and please join us in the offline learning revolution.